Hey guys, this is Don Van Zant, host of the Lost Mission Podcast. Uh, I just want to say a quick thank you for those that have joined in um, to the show today. If you stopped by to watch, if this is your first time here, I appreciate you stopping by. If you've seen before, thank you so much. You know what we do here. Um, our mission is to return back to the heart of the gospel. We want to know the gospel. We want to share the gospel. Uh, that's what we do. That's our desire here on the show. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, today's show is going to be a little bit different than the typical format. Now, a few weeks ago, I did a response to a podcast. Today's going to be very similar to that episode, and it will probably take me two, possibly three um, episodes to get through the entirety of what I want to say in response to this video. This isn't a sermon response uh, because what was spoken wasn't spoken in the context of being a sermon. It was more so of a pastor addressing some issues within his church and within the larger holiness movement and sort of the uh, the battleground that is uh, the internet and that is social media. So this was from Pastor Brent Marquis, who's a man that I'm acquainted with from my younger days. I haven't had much uh, to do with him in um, my sort of adult years. I don't know Brent all that well. Uh, I have seen him from time to time. Matter of fact, I saw him just a few months ago at a restaurant locally in my hometown, I was with my family, he was with his, and I just didn't feel like it was the time to go up and introduce myself uh, right then and there, but I am at least familiar with Brent, although I don't know him that well. But what Brent did, and you'll, he'll explain some of that in the video in a moment, Brent made a video, a series of videos at his home church in response to Berean holiness. Now, I'm not here to defend Berean. The, they can do that on their own. I'm, I'm not here to take their side per se, although I am in agreement with them, and if sides were there to be chosen, I would be on theirs. But I'm not here to defend Berean. I'm here to, to make an overview of Brent and his statements regarding Berean holiness and those of us that have spoken out uh, recently and in the past few years against what we see as abusive or false doctrine within the holiness movement. Um, now, I realize the nature of this conversation I realize this could be potentially offensive to some, so let me share with you the same disclaimer, uh, reworded a bit to fit the scenario that we're dealing with today, but the same disclaimer that I shared in my response to the Two Peas on a Pod podcast with Tim Brim discussing 1 Corinthians 11. Very similar disclaimer. If you find yourself offended by conversations that are a bit critical of a doctrinal position, or if you have deep convictions surrounding the things addressed in this video, I want to invite you right now uh, to turn off this show, walk away, just, just don't listen to it anymore if these things offend you. My goal is not to offend a weaker brother or cause anyone to stumble. I only hope to replace some bad theology with a good. I see too many people that have been hurt by these types of teachings and not only leave the holiness movements, but leave the faith altogether. Uh, while I'm grateful for all that are removing bad teaching from their lives, we must do more. To only remove bad teaching is deconstruction. Uh, and we must replace bad teaching with good. That's reconstruction. That is disentanglement. And that's what we're hoping to do or accomplish a little bit today in this video. So here's what I'm going to do. I am going to crack the top on this drink. Last time I had a Red Bull. Today it is a sparkling ice plus caffeine zero sugar, black raspberry, flavored sparkling water. These things are delightful. They're delicious. I'm going to crack the top on this. We're going to play an intro, and we're going to jump right into the video. Before we get too much into the video, I do want to give a few quick recommendations on some resources I could point you to that hopefully will help you as you are making a journey similar to those that, like myself and others, have made. The first resource that I want to recommend is a book by the title of, um, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. This is Colts Inside Out. Great book, but it's not the one that I'm recommending today. I want to recommend to you um, a book by Rick Allen Ross called uh Colts Inside Out. This is Colts in Our Midst. I want to recommend Colts Inside Out by Rick Allen Ross. 
Excellent book. Highly recommend. Also, this has been a changer, a game changer, and a life-changing book for me, Combating Cult Mind Control by Steve Hassan. I want to recommend this book to you. It's excellent. Um, and the third resource that I would like to recommend is titled When Narcissism Comes to Church by Chuck DeGroat. If you're looking for resources and you're like, I don't know where to go, I recommend those three books. Combating Cult Mind Control, Cults Inside Out, and When Narcissism Comes to to church. Let's see if I can get this thing up and going here. I'm going to do a screen recording of the video itself. There we go. Three, two, one, and we're going to hop right in here today. Looks like we're recording now. Let me set the stage a little bit here. Brent is in his church. It looks like on the platform of his church, there's a few chairs set up. He's, he's sitting there looking very pastoral. Uh, he's got his khaki pants and a pair of casual shoes, button down shirt, uh, one leg crossed uh, or, or across the other. His Bible is open. Looks like he may have an iPad. Uh, he looks he looks ready to do business. He looks like any typical pastor ready to go to a business meeting. That's what we have. So if you're not watching the video and you're only uh, hearing the audio of this, that's what you would see would be Brent on his platform. Uh, there are three chairs set up. He's the only one there. I believe it was just he and his sound guy were all that were present that day for the recording. So there's not a church full of people. It's just him giving a casual talk. That's the setting that we have here. All right. Also, let me make a quick apology. If you hear some feedback coming through the microphone, um, I'm sorry. It's June at the time of this recording. It's starting to get a little warm. I have a fan blowing inside of my studio. I would try to edit that out as much as I can in post, but if some of that makes through, my apologies. All right, we're going to begin the video right around the 56-second mark. Now, this video goes on for over an hour and a half. It is not a short video. I'm not going to respond to everything that Brent says. I just can't respond to all of it, quite honestly. But we're going to respond to several clips throughout the video. I think it will help help us to uh, kind of get the gist of what he's saying. So here we are, right around the 56 second mark. I want to, this video is multi-purpose. Uh, number one, uh, it will answer some of the questions that have been asked recently concerning the Berean movement. Uh, also, it will let some people get to know me a little bit because a lot of people seem to be real confused about who I am. And the, really the purpose of this is if a pastor has a young person in his church that may be confused uh, that may be a little bit out confused or whatever. Maybe they could point them in this direction as a resource for some good common sense. Because the gospel is common sense gospel. It's not near as complicated as people try to make it. It's just a, a common sense gospel. I'm amazed at our education that we have these days. And we, we have got so much education, but we can't understand the old King James Version. Okay, that's the, that's the intro to the video. And here's his stated goal. He wants to answer some questions about Berean holiness. Again, I'm not here to make a defense for Berean. They're, they're grown-ups. They can handle their own business. Uh, but he also wants people to get to know him a little bit. I want you guys to get to know me. <laughs> boy, boy, does that happen in the video. We get to see a side of Brent that is, it's something else. <laughs> and look, I do want to say this with love. I really want to make this video in love. Um, there are things I'm frustrated and I was angry about, but I don't want to let that anger be the thing that shines through. As always, there will be humor in this. We'll have to share a laugh. But I don't want to want that to be the overriding theme is cynicism and anger. I want to do this in love toward Brent. Um, but he also states he wants to put a resource out there for pastors he wants this video to be used as a resource in the future for any pastor that, that may want to pass this along to his young people or to his church that are, that are looking for answers. Answers for the Confused is the title of the video. Those that are looking for just some good common sense. And he gets into it right then and right there. He refers to the gospel as a common sense gospel. Um makes a statement, there's so much education, but we just can't seem to understand the old KJV. Uh, now watch out for this throughout the video. Watch what Brent is going to do. This is a prime example of him using loaded language uh, to make his point. He is going to use this loaded language throughout the entirety of this video. The majority of what he says is based upon loaded language. Things like referring to common sense. Well, it's just common sense. You may say, okay, well, what are you talking about? What is what is loaded language? Okay, well, a simple, uh, maybe not some 
a somewhat simple definition of loading language. What is loaded language? The term loading the language refers to a literalization of language and to words or images uh, becoming God. A greatly simplified language may seem cliche-ridden, common sense, may seem cliche-ridden, but can have enormous appeal and psychological power in its very simplification. Because every issue in one's life, and, and these are often very complicated young lives, can be reduced to a single set of principles that have an inner coherence. One can claim the experience of truth and fill it. Answers are available. Uh, Lionel Trilling has called this uh, language of non-thought because there's a cliche and a simple slogan to which most complex and otherwise difficult questions can be reduced. The pattern of doctrine over person occurs when there is a conflict between what one feels oneself experiencing and what the doctrine or dogma says one should experience. The internalized message in totalistic environments is that one must find the truth of the dogma and subject one's experiences to that truth. And we already see that happening in Brent's opening statement with his introduction. He's loading the language through this cliche-ridden approach to, to how he's going to discuss this topic tonight in order to bring people back into his view. Because in his mind, it's common sense. It's very simple. So it ought to be that way for you. And if it's not then you've got a problem. Okay, next clip. I want to please God to every brother and sister out there, to every young person that's struggling. You're never going to have all the answers. And the sooner you accept that, the better, better off you're going to be. I can ask questions to which there is no answer. Where did God come from? You know, where did Adam and Eve get their wives? And there's been some... Scholars have tried to figure it out, but really at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we find out the truth and how to find Christ and be saved and to know him. And so this ain't no big theological discussion. It's no big theological discussion. I mean, it's really not. You know, just 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 believe me. Come on. Just believe what I have to say. Uh, the, the, the sooner you accept that, the better off you'll be anyway. This, a statement like, the sooner you accept that, the better off you will be, is not a biblical statement. And it does not incite biblical faith. It doesn't push us to a biblical faith. That's blind faith, and biblical faith is not a blind faith. So Brent's definition of faith seems to be, and I don't want to misrepresent here, but if I'm interpreting him properly, it seems to be his idea of faith is accept what I am saying. Just accept it. That is faith. But biblical faith is utmost confidence in God's word, despite what men may say. So, if you find something that, that is contrary to the Word of God, you believe the Word of God. You don't believe the man. You don't say, the sooner you accept that, the better you'll be. You go back to the Word over and over and over and over again, and you let the Word of God speak into your life. If it disagrees with you, if it disagrees with your church, if it disagrees with your pastor, whomever it may disagree with, you fall in alignment with the Word of God. So it's not the sooner you accept that the better off you'll be that you just don't know everything. It's no, I want to pursue God and to know God. Next clip. <laughs> Let's start with what, what, what's, what has went down for those who say, what's this about, Brother Brent? Again, the, the, it's to give answers, to give answers to us for some many questions that's being asked. But, well, about three weeks ago, uh, it started earlier than that. I began to hear about this this movement out there, this this Facebook. I, and I know you're not going to believe this, but I've yet to even be on the site. I've never been on the site ever. Never been on the site. I've been told a few things here and a word here and a word there. I've never been on the site, have no need to be on the site. There's nothing new there. I pastor in a town with, with all kind of people that believe exactly what they believe. They're fighting old time holiness. I'm surrounded by this. It's been this been going on for a hundred years. <laughs> Okay, so what's this about? This is to give answers. It's his response to Berean holiness. But he claims to have never been on the site. I've never been on the site. I've never been there. This, this is his claim. This is what he says. Um, so here's my question for Brent. Brent, um, how can you give an answer to something you've never seen? How can you definitively and objectively answer something that you, by your own definition, by your own admission, know nothing about? 
You cannot give a sound reason answer to something you're not aware of. You just can't. Not unless you're just giving an, a, a biased answer, unashamedly. He's going to read and respond to a thread of comments from Berean Holiness, uh, but never deal with anything from Berean Holiness themselves. Yet he believes that all of us aligning ourselves with some of the things that Berean Holiness say um, are, are willfully ignorant. <laughs> he thinks we're ignorant, but he has admitted himself that he doesn't even know what's out there because he's never been on the site. <clears throat> so it's not my goal once more to defend Berean Holiness. They can do that on their own. It's my goal to deal with Brent's claims. Um, he talks about those fighting old time holiness uh, from a hundred years ago. Let's see if we can go back and catch that clip again. Pastor in a town with, with all kind of people that believe exactly what they believe. They're fighting old time holiness. Old-time holiness. I'm surrounded by this. It's been this been going on for a hundred years. Okay, this has been going on for a hundred years. So old time holiness, a hundred years ago. <laughs> what about the other twenty centuries of? church history. Like, if this is old time and it's 100 years ago, what about before then? I mean, if old time holiness is where it's at, what was the world prior to that? What what did we have in the 1600s when the King James was written? What did we have during the time of the, um, the Great Awakening? What did we have during the Protestant Reformation? What did we have in the early centuries uh, before the Great Schism and, and, and before... Um, the rise of Western culture. What, what did we have in the first three to four centuries when uh, Christians were being persecuted for their faith? What, what did we have? I don't know. Next clip. This is right around the four uh, minute and 24 second mark. He's going to identify the four groups of people that he's speaking to in this video. Let's hear what Brent has to say about these four groups. That God spoke to my heart, and He gave me two first, and He added two more. And we're going to talk about them so tonight. God spoke to there are four groups of people that these kind of groups prey on. Okay, and and this is why I told my church stay off of there. Do not do not get on these websites. Oh, you're not. Why are you so worried about it? I'm not worried about it at all. But I am worried because there's four groups of people that that people like Natalie and these people with her prey on. Number one, they prey on the feeble minded. The Bible says we are to comfort the feeble-minded, not convert the feeble-minded. They prey on people who, who don't have a lot of intellect, who do not know, and they're easily swayed, easily turned, easily moved. So they prey on the feeble-minded, okay? I work with some of those people. I might even qualify. Who knows? I have had chemo shots in the eyeball for the last 10 years, and it has made me a little foggy. So if I don't get every word right and my memory's not just perfect, again, they asked me to take it live. I said, no. They asked me to take it and record it, and we can edit it. No, we're not going to edit nothing. This is just who we are. This is who I am every day. So they pray on the feeble-minded. Then that Bible talks, they, they pray on those that are wounded, the hurt. Oh, you're hurt. You're hurt. Let us help you. Well, there's always hurt people, and anybody that's hurt wants somebody to pet on them and, and, and that. So they, they, they pray on the hurt. Uh, then they pray on new converts. They pray on new converts, novices, people that don't have any time in this, don't have any understanding, don't have any knowledge. And last but not least, they, they, they don't really pray on these people, but they, this is the majority of the people that get on their websites. And again, from the screenshots that have been sent to me, it's very clear. And these are the Bible people, the, the Bible calls these people willfully ignorant. And it uses that term in 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse number 5. They are willfully ignorant. And we'll be reading that scripture here in just a little while. <laughs> okay, there's Prince Ford. <laughs> there's Prince Ford groups. Uh, the feeble-minded, the wounded and hurt, uh, the new converts or novices, and those that are willfully ignorant. So let's, let's talk about this, these four groups just a little bit. Um, he, he takes this idea of the feeble-minded from the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14, and he's reading from the King James, and I'm not against the King James. I love the King James version of the Bible. Uh, but the King James rendering of 1 Thessalonians 5, 14 says, Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Uh, to my knowledge, the King James is the only translation that uses the phrase or the word feeble-minded. I'm not going to go into the Greek and give all the definitions of that um, for this video. We could. Uh, I think it's only used a few times in the scripture. 
<clears throat> even in the Septuagint, I don't think that it's referenced that much at all. Maybe Eusebius uh, used the word a few times in his writing later on in church history, but anyway, when, when he refers to the feeble-minded, this is during the 17th century translation of the King James, and feeble-minded would have had a different um, sort of cultural context and meaning of the word. It doesn't mean mentally handicapped in the way that Brent is using it. And that's why I think every other modern translation has actually gotten it right and has translated this word well. Let me read it to you from uh, the ESV, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 14. We urge you, brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all, um, with them all. So, King James, feeble-minded, um, but every other translation says faint hearted. And look, there's a larger context to this passage that, that apparently um, Brent has missed here because he's just gone in on this one verse without looking at the entirety of the book, seeing what Paul is talking about here. Um, the book of First Thessalonians, both the writings of First and Second Thessalonians, Paul is writing to a struggling church in Thessalonica, um, and they are being persecuted. Some have even died. And they are worried that, that Christ will return and that their loved ones will not uh, go with them into the eternal kingdom of God. And so that's why Paul writes to them and gives an assurance in chapter 4 that, that Christ will return, the dead in Christ will be raised first. And he says, you know, comfort one another with these words. It's, it's, a, it's a book of comfort written uh, to a church, the church in Thessalonica. It's not saying, he's, Paul is not referring to a mentally handicapped group of people here. He's referring to a people that are faint of heart. Uh, in a modern context, we would say they're discouraged or they're fearful. Brent seems to have missed that. So the phrase feeble-minded is actually much better translated by the modern translations as faint-hearted. So Brent is wrong here because he doesn't understand the way the Bible works. Uh, he doesn't understand historical narrative, the development of language, or just good old simple reading of the text. <laughs> His common sense approach is already crumbling and falling in on itself. This verse has nothing to do with intellect and everything to do with discouragement. Brent's already wrong. Uh, he mentions the wounded and the hurt, and again, loads the language with saying that they prey on the wounded and the hurt. He mentions new converts and novices. Now, look, I've been doing this show uh, for two or three years, and I've not had a lot of guests on my podcast, but the few that I've had uh, have been very educated men. At least one has had a PhD. I believe both. I've only had two guests, um, Dr. Stephen Boyce and Dr. Mark Ward, that have uh, guest appeared on my show. They're very educated men. They are no novices. Um, they're no new converts. They understand Christianity very well. Uh, so the majority of people I dealt with have spent the majority of their lives as Christians. Many of them, the majority of their lives in the holiness movement. Very few are novices. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I'm dealing with somebody that I believe is kind of newer to this or is a novice, I slow down um, uh, and, and I over-explain because they usually really just don't get it. And I want to make sure that they get it. Even if they don't agree, I want to make sure that, that things are being understood. So the, the new convert idea doesn't hold water. <clears throat> and fourth, he talks about those that are willfully ignorant. And he mentions uh, 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 5. Uh, let's read verses 1 through 5 of that passage. Uh, this is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I'm stirring you up by sincere mind, by way of reminder, that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles. Knowing this, first of all, the scoffers will come in um, the last days with scoffing, scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of the water, and through the water, and by the word of God. Um, so he's talking about those that are willingly ignorant. And it seems like he's just grabbing for phrases. He must have just uh, searched for the phrase, one to find, where it says they're willfully ignorant. He's, he's ignoring context altogether. This is an eschatological passage that's dealing with the return of Christ, citing Old Testament examples of creation, the forming of the earth, um, 
and that sort of constant state of change that geographically the world has gone through since the beginning of time, nothing about discussions surrounding doctrine. That's just not what Peter's talking about in this passage. So this idea of being uh, willfully ignorant. Brent, sir, if you see this video, if those of you that are, that are out there that are screenshotting or screen recording things, feel free to send this to Brent. Brent, sir, just just take a moment and, and actually read your Bible. Read the context of Scripture. Let it inform your perspective, and, and, and don't let your perspective drive your interpretation. All right, next clip. Let's, let's move on. We're about the 7 minute and 46 second mark. 7.44. Time, so that's kind of the extent of it. Now, so are you worked up? I'm not worked up about this. Again, I want to put something out there so that people can look at and understand. And then, in looking at some of the screenshots, it looks like there are some people that are hungry for the truth. And if you would happen to tune into this, then now you can hear truth and you can have an opportunity. You still have to choose whether you want truth or not. And really, that's what Berean is supposed to be someone searching for higher truth and drawing closer to God. And, and this has just turned into an organization for a bunch of backsliders who want an excuse for their sin. Okay, so he has the question, are you worked up? Brother Brent, are you worked up? <laughs> um, he talks about those that are hungry for the truth and says, hey, you want truth? Then, then watch, watch this video. Watch what I have to say. <laughs> and to this point in the video, I've heard no truth. I mean, I've heard truth claims made, uh, but almost no truth has been told to this point. Um, in the video, he's not operating truthfully. He's operating on his confirmation bias. Instead of being truthful, he's allowing his bias to come in and just just win the conversation. Uh, he mentions that we are a bunch of backsliders that want an excuse for their sin. Uh, I can't speak for everybody, but not me. I don't want an excuse for my sin. I sin regularly. I hate it. I hate the fact that, that, that I find myself sinning so very much. But I want to keep a posture of repentance and, and a heart for the truth of God. So here's the thing. If you see me sin, correct me. Come to me. Correct me. Let's, let's, let's be accountable to one another. Let's hold each other accountable for our sins. All right? I want that. I, did, I long for that. I desire that. When I was within the holiness movement, I would go to people and, and tell them, look, I know that people disagree with me, and I'm giving you opportunity. Please rebuke me. Here's your chance. Do it. I, I truly want that. I'm not, I'm not saying that um, using hyperbole or being facetious at all. I truly want to be corrected if I'm being sinful. I want to be accountable. All right. Uh, 826, Mark. Let's move to there. I have no beef with her. One time she was hurt by a preacher. Get in line. We all have been. Okay, the the video stalled out on the audio for some reason. I didn't do that, so don't don't think that I cut his video. I I just I didn't. That that happened. Um, so he talks about those that have been hurt by a preacher, and he just real just pushes it to the side. Get in line. Get in line with the rest of us. We've all been hurt. I believe that. Like I really do. I believe people have been hurt by the ministry. People have been hurt by preachers. Um, and, and again, I hate to borrow cliches in such a cliche-ridden uh, video, but two wrongs don't make it right. <laughs> Look, this is stereotypical narcissism and spiritual abuse. So, from Rick Allen Ross in his book, um, he tells a story about spiritual abuse. Let me, let me, let me share that with you. In a certain abusive cult started by Muslim extremist Malachi York, many members were abused emotionally, sexually, and physically, and they still continue to defend York. And here's an excerpt uh, from Rick Allen Ross and his book, Cults Inside Out. Many of York's followers and even his victims have defended him despite his criminal behavior. Former group member Sadiq Red explained the ultimate success of a con man is to make the person who's being conned Make excuses for the con man. If I can get you to deny reality, then I have, in fact, controlled your mind. We've all been hurt by a preacher. Get in line. If I can get you to deny reality, if I can get you to just say, okay, fine, I'll just, I'll just hush. I'll get, I'll get in line with everybody else. I've controlled your mind. 
And that's what Bryn's doing here. This is narcissism. This is spiritual abuse. This is an attempt at, at, at mind control. Now, I'm sure Brent doesn't realize that. I'm sure that Brent doesn't even see that as what he's doing. But it is what he's doing. All right. Let's move to the nine-minute mark. i tell you what has surrounded her is a bunch of people who are looking for an excuse for their backslidings. And they just don't want to say, I'm just, I'm just lost. I want to go to hell. I mean, I don't want to go to hell. And so if I can find somebody that will tell me I'm going to heaven, that will make me feel better about myself. Okay. Um, his, his phrase, I'm lost, but I just don't want to go to hell. So here's the deal. Um, and Brent's going to kind of come back to this later on in the video. But here, here's the thing. It's not Brent's job to decide who is or isn't saved. It's not Brent's job to decide who goes to heaven and who goes to hell. He doesn't get to make that decision. He's not God. He doesn't have that authority to say, this person's going to hell. You, <laughs> no man has that much power or authority in their lives. Furthermore, if your view of salvation is simply heaven or hell, then it's a low view. If, if that's all that Brent is in this for, is so that he doesn't have to go to hell, and that he gets to go to heaven when he dies, and I don't know that he is, but I'm saying if he is, um, then he has a very low view of salvation. Salvation is being saved from sin, from the kingdom of sin, and being brought into the kingdom of God. It's living for and serving Christ in this life. And as far as salvation is concerned, I was actually reading this today in my uh, devotional time this morning, such a beautiful scripture, and it's the essence of the gospel. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So that's how it happens. With the confession of our mouth, with the believing in our heart, and we are saved. Uh, sanctification, on the other hand, is that hard work of, of bearing fruit after conversion. But, but salvation is so much more than just choosing an eternal destination. Like, where am I going to go when I die? Salvation is so much more than just that. San sanctification is the working out of that. Salvation is also in this life. We get to serve Christ and live for Christ. Praise God. I'm, I'm glad to be a Christian in this world. I really am. It's a thrilling thing to me every day to... Uh, be given the express honor of serving God. Now, if we had life at hope in this life only, we would be of all men most miserable. We know that there is um, an eternal reward, uh, but there's more to it than that. Okay, let's move on to about the 1008 mark. This is, this is a group of people that's favorite scripture, judge not that you be not judged. There it is. <laughs> judge not that you be not judged. And uh, again, these people don't even know who I am. Uh, I will say I don't blame them for putting my picture on there on their conference because how in the world are you going to get anybody to come, you know, with what they're going to be offering? Just people getting up there whining and crying about how they was delivered from living close to God. So, I mean, that's not going to draw very many people. And definitely ain't going to bring them back next year. Now, around here, they use smoke machines. Harley Ride right, Harley Davidson's down now. Maybe they'll bring the power team in to break something. I don't know. Okay, so there it is. Judge not. That's, that's, their, that's their favorite scripture. I mean, it's not mine. It's in the Bible. I love it. I love what Christ has to say. It's not mine. Um, I've corrected people multiple times on the misuse and abuse of that passage, but it's not mine. Um, and then he makes this crazy, goes on this odd tirade about um, what's going to happen at the Berean Holiness Conference, and and I don't even know. I don't. I'm not. I, I'm not going to the conference. Um, you know, I wish all the best to those that are going and. I pledge my full support to it, uh, but I'm not. Don't plan to go. He mentions the power team. I don't know if he's saying that churches in his area bring the power team in, or if he's speculating that Berean is going to have the power team to come in. I don't know what he's trying to say there. Uh, but these types of comments just make me roll my eyes. They're ridiculous. This is this. Is, that's a ridiculous moment, Brent. Come on, be better than that. <clears throat> um, and, I, and I do want to just add at this point in the video that I, I, if you want to watch this video in its entirety, I will do my best to link um, to it in the comment section of this video or in the show notes. That way you can go and find it. 
I'm not withholding anybody from seeing the full video. I just don't have time to respond to every bit of it. All right, 11 minute, uh, about the 11.07, 11.06 mark. Let's go. I don't have, uh, uh, we have Ethan over here says, I don't have time to argue that a bunch of people proceeds to argue with him three weeks in a row. Like I said, we talked about five more. Um, I guess this is Natalie. Believe it or not, there's a lot more that we haven't shared. At this point, we just use the snippets that are helpful for advertising. And there's the key word right there. They will never play an entire message. I did. Of Brother Gallagher preaching. They will never play an entire message unless it's something that, you know, they just, they can just take snippets and, and break it down. Okay, I'm glad he mentions that here. I just said that I'm not going to do the entire video. I'm going to link to it. Go watch it. Um, no, I'm not responding to your entire video, Brent. There was a lot of nonsense that, that was said, and I just don't care to respond to every bit of that. <laughs> However, I did do a word-for-word, clip-by-clip, a full response to a podcast. Now, it was not a sermon, so if you want to split hairs there, fair, you win. Uh, but I, I, I responded to Tim Brim, two peas on a, on a pod, and their use of 1 Corinthians 11. And I and I did for that very reason, I didn't want somebody to say they'll never use a full episode. I responded to every single thing that was said. And I will try to also link that video in the description as well. So, Brent, sir, uh, let me let me inform you. We will, and I already have. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> See, look, he's just, he, he doesn't realize what he's doing. I really don't think he, he gets it. Um, all right, let's move on to about the 13 minute mark. 13, uh, 29 is what I'm showing. 1350, anyway, 13 some odd. Let's, let's be careful. I still don't regret standing against Bebo and MySpace and all those things that I was preaching against Kristen in the day because they wrecked and ruined many, many lives. Facebook is still destroying lives. Hundreds of thousands of marriages have been ruined on Facebook. But I came to the realization, I stood in my pulpit and I said, God. Now, he's, he has a point there. There's a danger in social media. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to give you that, Brent. There is a danger. There's a danger there. So thank you for bringing that up. I, I, I've come to the realization that we must have we must have the ability to buy and trade. I mean, this is even the Amish have to be able to sell their goods to make money to to buy groceries to buy what they can't grow to you know and, and must have you must have commerce. <laughs> okay, so first he mentions Bebo and MySpace. I mean, what year is this? <laughs> His references, they're definitely a little bit dated. <laughs> when I heard him mention Bebo, oh, wow, I was taken back uh, through the early 2000s. As a matter of fact, it seems as though I may have been in the service, but I think he made a comment once in the camp meeting, and you know, he blasted the internet, and he said, stick that in your Bebo and smoke it. <laughs> uh, he's still doing it. He's still doing it. Good on you. Oh, good for you, Brent. Uh, and like I said, I agree with him on the talking to other people's spouses things. Um, we should be very, very careful. And, you know, if you want to have a joint Facebook account or not have Facebook or whatever, whatever, you know, you do you. Um, he has a point there. There have been a lot of people that have fallen into sin, sexual immorality and, and sinful things through things like social media. I'm not going to push back on that. But then, but then... He mentions commerce. Now that's different. We must have commerce. See, the conversation changes when we mention money. Well, you got to have Facebook if you want to make a dollar. Really? No, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. If you want to be legalistic, I, if you want to use Facebook Marketplace, I I personally don't care, but I also don't mind you using social media. But there are other ways to make money, Brent, sir. There's possibility for you to make a dollar doing something that doesn't require you to sell on Facebook Marketplace. That's not essential. <laughs> so the con the conversation changes. We got to make money. I mean, I almost got to make money. Everybody's got to make money, 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 money. Boy, isn't it strange when you bring up the money conversation, how that people start to pivot. All right, 17 minutes, 57 seconds. And uh, so here we go. 
Uh, here, here, here's, here's, here's a good one. Let's, 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 let's talk about this. All those young kids on the platform laughing and being taught this behavior is okay. My heart breaks. This kind of preaching will not sustain those young kids. Well, you just got to really be willfully ignorant to say stuff like that. Willfully ignorant. I know it will work because I happen to be a fourth generation holiness preacher. His bias. That doesn't make me special. I just know that this kind of preaching will sustain him. I happen to know that it works because my boys are fifth generation holiness preachers and okay. they're married and love their wives and treat their wives good and have got beautiful grandsons that are being raised up in church. This will sustain you. This really, it really works good. Now, I don't know what kind of church you went to, uh, Stephanie. Uh, I, I don't know, uh, Aaliyah, uh, what kind of church you went to to make you say <laughs> stupid stuff like that. Really? And my heart breaks for you, but this will sustain you. You know, let, let, let's, let's get, get to that point. And so if you're watching and you're saying, Brother Brent, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry. What kind of a group of people, think about this, what kind of a group of people makes it their mission to make people draw, get farther away from God? Somehow until you go put on a bathing suit and go lay out on the beach in your bra and underwear, you're not free. Okay, okay. Wow, a lot was said there. So the comment, I guess, from whoever it was on this thread, they said this type of preaching will not sustain. Brent just counters back, yes, it will. You know, there's just argument. Yes, it will. No, it won't. He mentions however many generations that he has in the holiness movement. For some reason, that's a flex. That's a flex in, in the holiness church. I can't speak for other denominations. I'm sure it is in others as well. But they like to tell you how many generations back this thing goes for them. I, I don't understand that flex. Um, when I was in the movement, I came in, and I was just a kid, me, uh, my mother, my sister. Uh, we, we got saved, gave our lives to the Lord. Beautiful story. Maybe I'll tell it sometime on here. But we didn't have a heritage of holiness. That wasn't what we came into. Um, but he likes to reference his heritage, and that's a flex for, for the movement. More name-calling, belittling comments, you know, calling people stupid. You know, you say stupid things like that. Um, he calls them willfully ignorant. You know, um, it's just, he's just putting people down um and so what happens is he's he's denying these people their authentic self and they have to take on the cult identity so the idea is you have so many generations so deep into this that if you disagree how how dare you who do you think you are so you have these, these two competing ideals inside of our minds sometimes you have the authentic self that's who we really are then we have this other identity the cult identity in this case that that comes against that and we don't know which one to listen to so many times. Uh, so there's no room in a mind control environment regarding the group's beliefs as mere theory or as a way to interpret or seek reality. Now, the doctrine is reality. Some groups go so far as to teach that the entire material world is illusion. Therefore, all thinking, desires, and action, except of course those prescribed by the cult, do not really exist. The most effective cult doctrines are those which are unverifiable and unevaluable. Uh, in the words of Eric Hoffer, they may be so convoluted that it would take years to untangle them. Which a lot of us are trying to untangle things. It would take years to untangle them. By then, people have been directed away from studying the doctrine to more practical pursuits such as fundraising and recruiting. Uh, doctrine is to be accepted, not understood. Therefore, the doctrine must be vague and global, yet also symmetrical enough to appear consistent. Its power comes from its assertion that it is the one and only truth and that it encompasses everything. Since mind control depends on creating a new identity within the individual, cult doctrine always requires that a person distrust their authentic self. The doctrine becomes the master program for all their thoughts, feelings, and actions. Since it is the truth, perfect and absolute, any flaw in it is viewed as a reflection of the believer's own imperfection. That's from Combating Cult Mind Control. We just saw that. We just saw Brent when somebody said, hey, this won't work. Yes, it does. So many generations back, they've all said it. There's no way that you can tell me that it doesn't work. We've, we've seen a person coming into their authentic self, and Brent is dragging them, kicking and screaming if need be, back into 
uh, the cult identity. Those are stupid things to say. You're willfully ignorant. Uh, you're not free until you lay out on the beach in your underwear. And he mentions this several times in the video. He keeps coming back to this. You lay out on the beach in your underwear. You go out on the beach and you commit fornication. You go out on the beach and you take your clothes off. And I don't. I, I have no clue. Honest to God, I have no clue what Brent's talking about there. Uh, he's talking about something. He's got something in his mind, but I don't know what he's, what he's getting at. Brent, brother, I don't know, man. Uh, so, sounds like fear tactic, but I don't know where he's coming from. I don't know what he's getting at there. All right, let's move on um, to about the 22 minute, 54 second, 52 second mark. Stupid comments on here. Stupid just comments. because they just don't want to say, look, we don't want to carry our cross. We don't want to deny ourselves. We don't want to follow him. You, you just, 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 just say it. I don't want to pay the price anymore. I hope God has mercy on me. But, but this burden, you know, I was, I was in it, and I got out, and I got free. You want to be burdened about something? Come with me down twice a week to the juvenile detention center, and I'll show you something to be burdened for. I'll show you something. You want to get choked up about something? Let's go over to Haiti to the orphanage that our church supports over there. That's got. Now that now trying to feed 90 orphans, 50 in the one we support, and they 20 in another, 20, and trying to find a way to get food and groceries to them, and get fresh water for them, and drill a well. Let, let, you want to get choked up about something? I mean, you're worried about. I got something to be worried about, but I'm not worried about getting that little Mennonite girl to get on a bathing suit and go lay out on the beach and commit fornication with somebody. See there, he said it again. I don't, I don't know what his obsession is with this idea of going to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a bad experience at the beach, Brent? <laughs> oh, forgive me. I'm sorry. I shouldn't laugh. Um, but more seriously, he says, look, they just don't want to carry their cross. He makes that statement. You don't want to carry the cross. And then he, he goes into launching into this discussion of his own good works and the things that he does. And I'm not trying to take away from his good works. I appreciate good works. He mentions the juvenile detention center. He's going to repeat this ad nauseum throughout the video. The juvenile detention center. Juvenile detention center. <laughs> that and the beach. There's two of his favorite things to talk about. Uh, he mentions uh, orphans. And so I appreciate those things. But again, that's not the point. Brent, that's not the point. This is a distraction to the point. Uh, something many abusers will do. How dare you speak against us? How dare you say those things? Look at all the good we've done for you. Look at all we have done. Look at all I have done. Look at the times I've gone to the juvenile center. Look at the orphans that we take care of. How dare you speak against us? But that, that, that's not the point. I appreciate the work, but that's not the point. The point is the abuse, not the smokescreen of good works. <clears throat> Rick Allen Ross, in his book, um, Cults Inside Out, uh, he, he talks about the sort of black and white thinking that exists in, in these types of groups. He says, ultimately, the, kill, the cult milieu uh, produces a type of mindset that is essentially the byproduct of the cult's systematic process of coercive persuasion. We can typically see this through the polarized black and white thinking cult members express. They exhibit a low tolerance of ambiguity and often express a relentlessly judgmental attitude. Cult members frequently develop something like the jeweler's eye, a constricted selective vision that searches out and finds the tiniest flaws and imperfection in anything or anyone outside the group. When viewing the group, however, the cult member's vision changes to a soft focus, which obscures almost anything negative. Correspondingly, Cult members often see almost everything in polarized oppositional terms, what can be seen as us versus them uh, in the world. The members group, or the us, is cast as the ultimate good, and those outside the group, or the them, are frequently characterized as negative or even threatening. You see how Brent has done that here? He's made these characterizations He's looked through this jeweler's eye. Everything out here is terrible, but look at all the good that we do. And is teaching his people to all of them. Those guys are bad, but all of us are all good. Um, he's so critical and judgmental of those outside his group. But 
when the spotlight is shifted back to him, it's look at all this good. Look at all the good things I've done, man. There's no way that we could be wrong. Look at all the good we've done. Come on. All right, next clip. Let's see. We are right around the 26 uh, minute and 12 second, 26, 12, or 26, 10. All right. What do you have to say? How did that sermon edify the body of Christ? Last I could check, that clip wasn't a sermon. I was just in between services and was getting a little chuckle that they had used me uh, to try to get more people to come to their convention. So um, don't worry. If you want to know about the grace of God and, and, and how to get to heaven, just watch this video or come to the church or watch a full sermon. We'll help you. Okay, how's that sermon edifying? Well, it wasn't a sermon first. I mean, let's just get that straight. It wasn't even a sermon. I was getting a chuckle between the services. <laughs> I don't even know what to say to that. Come on, dude. <laughs> Come on, Brent. <laughs> oh, brother. Love you, man, but that's that's not it. You know, you get what they're saying. Semantics, you're debating semantics. Um, <laughs> but then he mentions, you know, if you want to know about the grace of God and how to get to heaven, there we go, there's that, how to get to heaven. Um, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, I've not really seen much gospel um, teaching or, or approach to the gospel at all in this. This whole idea of how to get to heaven feels more like an Alan Jackson song than it feels like gospel teaching to me. Where's the grace? He talks about the grace of God. Question is, where is the grace? I've seen, seen zero grace in this video. And look, I truly believe that Brent has helped people. I'm not taking away. I'm trying not to take away from any good that Brent has done. Um, but in this video, in the way he's conducting himself surrounding this issue, I see no grace. Brent has, has shown none. And that's not the point. Uh, or, or, or the point is to show grace. You know, um, Scripture speaks of Christ when he came and says that he was full of grace and truth. So we want both grace and truth. I've just not seen much grace um, in this video. All right, we are coming up on an hour in this video. I'm going to take a break right here. We'll come back and uh, wrap this up with part two. We haven't even gotten into the good stuff yet. There's still so much to say. Uh, so I'm going to end it right here. I'm going to take a little break and we'll come back and uh, we'll, we'll finish this up. So for now, guys, until I see you next time, grace and peace. And I'll catch you later. <laughs>